so we have a very brief introduction of uh, of OPP before we move ahead. So as you know that uh, the purpose of this organization, it's a platform for the people who endeavor to enhance cooperation among communities to, pro to promote progressive values. Our vision is unity and diversity, and our mission is to strive to eliminate exploitation and discrimination in dialogues. Uh, our inclinations, politically, we believe in democracy, human rights, minority rights, gender equality, and we have no affiliation with any political party whatsoever. Re on the religious front, we believe in separation of religion and state, and socially, we believe, believe in inclusion, intolerance, acceptance, and harmony. Uh, so if you are interested in obviously more information, you can contact us through various channels, and please do contact and do uh, take an active part in our in, in, in our platform. Uh, back to today's uh, uh, topic. Uh, I'll start with a, with a quote from Michael Elner, and it uh, says, just look at us, everything is backwards, everything upside down, doctors destroy health, lawyers destroy justice, universities destroy knowledge, governments destroy freedom, the major media destroy information and the religions that destroy spirituality. I mean, if something would have summed up the situation in Pakistan, this is it. Uh, this is what actually we are really going the, 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 the wrong direction from uh, reverse of what uh, Darwin said. Uh, let me just to put the context around before we invite our two distinguished speakers, let me put uh, the, the topic in a small context. I mean, we are in a situation that we have a never ending crisis in every single aspect of life, whether we talk about politics, economics, uh, socially, everything is really in a crisis. And that crisis is increasing day by day instead of uh, someone trying to deal with it. So we have an unprecedented public debt, which is increasing every every, every year. And as it is said that uh, in, in Pakistan, it doubles, roughly it doubles its debt every five years for the last 25 years, while the GDP grows only on average of 3% uh, per annum. So you see this big discrepancy in, uh, in, the, in the growth. Uh, we have unprecedented inflation. Everything is unprecedented. Unprecedented number of children out of the school. I mean, we see here at this uh, latest uh, number is about 24 million students between the age of, uh, I think, five, 15 and 20, they are out of school. Uh, unprecedented percentage of population is undernourished. And the, the, the figures are really very, very alarming because they say that 24% of the whole population is undernourished, so they don't have enough food. Unprecedented percentage of the population is suffering from Melton illness. And that is also a number of, it's about 15 million people in Pakistan suffer from mental in, uh, illness. Unprecedented media control, you all know the stories every day, people disappearing right, left, center, and. Uh, there is the control on what you can say and what you can do. Restrictions on the uh, on expression, freedom of expression, attacks on civil society groups, religious extremism, uh, and uh, sectarianism. We see unprecedented abuses against women and children, and corruption has become really a way of life. So, if this is not crisis, what is? Uh, so we are in this situation, continuing with our introduction, uh, con we have constitutional crisis. You see everyone bending the constitution, breaking the constitution the way it suits the, the, the powerful. There's battle between the institutions. All institutions are fighting each other, everyone trying to assert himself, herself. Politicians are fighting for power like syndicates. It's really, it reminds you of power, of a fighting for power between, between the mafia groups who controls what. And worst of all, all the important issues which relate to the people, they are never debated in detail. Nobody, they are not even worthy of political debates. All debates are about, about the power struggle, about how to uh, outmaneuver the other ones. So we kind of entered a tunnel 76 years ago, and there is no end in sight, as it seems. 
And every time we see a little light uh, from the other side, it turns out to be a train coming from the other direction rather than some real light. So after spending 76 years in this tunnel, we really have developed a tunnel vision. So if I uh, move on to the next one. So this is what we have become. After 76 years in a, in a cage, we have become like the birds who think flying is an illness. And this is how we have started behaving and thinking. So having said that, having put this brief context around our, around our today's topic, I would like now to introduce our two speakers today. And because of the circumstances, uh, Farooq Tariq is sitting right next to me, and Dr. Amar Jan is sitting in Lahore, I guess, yes. and he will be speaking to us from there. So here are our two uh, honorable speakers today. Uh, first is Farooq Tariq sitting right next to me, and he will speak shortly. Uh, he is General Secretary of uh, Kisan Rapta Committee, is President of uh, Hukuk Khalq Party in Pakistan, is member of Editorial Board of Daily Jadojets, a very fine magazine, keeping us up to date on what's going on. He's member of a Steering Committee at People's SARC, he's member of Asia Europe People's Forum called A AEPF. He's also advisor at South Asia Alliance for Poverty Eradication. Our second equally distinguished speaker, and it's very, very, I'm honestly very happy to have uh, Dr. Amar, Amar Ali Jan because he represents, represents the younger generation uh, of freedom fighters in Pakistan, and he has made a big, big impact after returning to Pakistan and really taking part in this uh, uh, active struggle uh, for, the, for the rights of the people. So he's a historian, a youth leader, an academic. He's founder of uh, Hukuk Khal Party, and he has uh, really in-depth knowledge, as you will see in a minute, of the complex social, economic, socio-economic, and political problems, particularly in Pakistan. So uh, let me now give the microphone or the floor to uh, Amar Saab. It's all yours. Uh, so what we will do is we will have both speakers, first Amar and then Farooq Tariq, speak for something like 10, 15 minutes each. To, to have their views about the topic. And then we will open the floor for discussion. So you can feel free to ask any question, express your opinions. Please keep them short. And uh, please also stay within the topic. I mean, it sometimes happens because we are a large group of people and there are so many issues happening around us. So we tend to kind of deviate from the, from the topic of it. So we would like to then uh, move on now and I will... Uh, you don't want to share any screen, so I would like to close this. And stop. So thank you so much uh, to uh, all friends of uh, Overseas Progressive Pakistanis for hosting this event. Uh, as suggested, of course, we would start with uh, sympathy for what's happening in uh, Gaza. Uh, we did a few events here in solidarity with the Palestinians. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to uh, begin with this message of solidarity. Um, as far as Pakistan is concerned, uh, you see, often when you look at uh, what's happening uh, in the news, uh, even since yesterday, actually since a week ago, it's been about, as Patisa very rightly pointed out, it's been about uh, major political leaders, uh, their internal rivalries, palace intrigues, who will become the prime minister? Who will strike a deal with the military establishment? These are some of the these uh, things that we see. Um, I feel they are symptoms of the crisis. They are not the crisis themselves. Um, so what I would try to do is I would break down the crisis at three levels, uh, which is one is uh, the economic level, one is the political level, and one is at the social level. And, and it's this crisis that's happening within the economic, political, and social structure, uh, which manifests itself in the kinds of rhetoric you see on TV, uh, uh, on, on, on the news channels every day. So to begin with, um, it was rightly pointed out that Pakistan is going through a very difficult economic crisis. Um, at the macro level, what does it mean? It means that Pakistan uh, is unable to carry out any of the reforms that, that the leadership in the country promised. Um, 
it has it it's um, the debt that it owes to international financial institutions as well as domestic uh, banks has far exceeded its capacity uh, to to generate production in the country. One example I would give you is that uh, by next year, the money that Pakistan is supposed to repay the independent power projects, the IPPs, is estimated to be 1 trillion rupees. 1 trillion rupees next year. It's the amount of money we have to give to the private companies operating in the power sector. Uh, to put it in context, our education budget, the education budget of a country of about uh, 230 million people is 40 billion rupees, uh, which is about, uh, so, so the amount that we are supposed to give to the IPPs is about 25 times more than the amount that we are willing to spend on our youth's future on education. So 40 billion on uh, education, 1 trillion to independent power projects. This independent, the, these independent power projects, um, IPPs as they're called here, some of you uh, would know that they were part of this process of privatization that happened in the late 80s and uh, early 90s. Uh, the idea was that we will have private investors in the energy sector, in the banking sector, in other sectors of the economy, including the education sector. And what we're seeing in Pakistan is a kind of gangster capitalism. Uh, some people say crony capitalism, gangster capitalism, whereby you have these firms, these private investors who invest in things, who, who buy things like banks, they buy independent power projects, they make investments in land, in corporate farming, all these glossy things that have been talked about over the past years. But it's a very different kind of capitalism from what you would see even in, in the West, whereby there's not a free market that's created. Instead, you have monopolists who take over these companies, who take over these sectors because they have contacts within the state. So for example, the independent power projects were uh, initially, the investment was from South America. And then right after that, a lot of locals, a lot of big powerful actors in, in within Pakistan, they started owning independent power projects. And only two years ago, uh, there was a report launched by the Pakistani government, which said that these independent power projects owe the Pakistani government 540 billion rupees. So there were scams of 540 billion rupees in the independent power projects. And that report, it's a report from 2021, and that report was immediately suppressed. Why? Because now not only do you have Americans who have invested in the independent power projects, you have generals who have invested in them, you have landed elites who have invested in them, you have corporate elites who have invested in them. Similarly, if you look at our uh, corporate farming that's happening over the last few years, uh, the, um, the amount of subsidies that we give to just the sugar barons of Pakistan, uh, this is often in Pakistan called the sugar mafia, and it includes people from different political parties and different sections of the state. The subsidy that's given annually to them is 110 billion rupees. Again, that is about three times the amount of money that we spend on higher education in Pakistan. If you, take, if you keep on going into different sectors of the economy, uh, including land, including banks, including big oil companies, you will see that there's a nexus between very powerful actors in these industries and the state. They're often, as I said, they're revolving doors where they, are, they become ministers, they become technocrats, they're close to the bureaucrats, they put them on their own uh, board of governors. As a result, a report came out recently, uh, which was written by, it's a report, it's a 2019 report written by Dr. Hafiz Pasha, and it was published by the UNDP, which said that the annual subsidies that are being given to the elites in Pakistan amount to $17.4 billion, $17.4 billion, which in Pakistani rupees is 
uh, is equal to uh, 2,700 billion rupees. These are annual subsidies, annual privileges being enjoyed by the richest Pakistanis every year. Just to put it in context, this is at least six times more than the amount that is given for any wealth, for, the, for all the welfare projects combined in Pakistan. So in that sense, we often say that Pakistan is a welfare state for the rich. There is socialism in Pakistan, but for the rich. Uh, so we have a capitalism in which the losses are being incurred by the government and the profits are being uh, appropriated by the, the private investors. So you have, this, this is the best deals that you can get. And one of the results of this, of this arrangement is that industrialists in Pakistan, they don't have to be very competitive. They don't have to uh, increase their production. They don't have to innovate. They have guaranteed profits, which means our industry over the years has lagged behind. Uh, other industries in the region. And a lot of people are spending money in speculation, whether it's in land or uh, in, in, uh, in, in banks and other kinds of financial instruments. Now on the people's side, the effect of this economic uh, loot and plunder that's being done by the elites, the, the effect is that when every few years there's an economic crisis, uh, Ordinary people who have not taken any of these loans, who, as was rightly pointed out, are not, many of them are not even getting enough food in their homes. Many of them don't have good paying jobs. Many of them don't even get safe drinking water. We've done surveys in Pakistan where we found out that a vast a majority of people in Lahore, which is the central city in Pakistan, uh, about 65% of the water is not drinkable. It's contaminated with sewage. So this is the living condition of so many people and over 20 million children are out of school. So all, all, the low, all, all, all the big money has been enjoyed by the elites. But when it comes to returning these loans, what the state does is because it cannot touch any of these elites, it cannot increase taxes on the corporate sector. The corporate sector alone uh, takes over 700 billion rupees in subsidies. It cannot uh, tax uh, uh, big agriculturists. It cannot even think of taxing the generals if they want to uh, live in Pakistan. So when all of that architecture of power is out of reach of any kind of taxation, any kind of reforms, then what do they do? They say, okay, we have a big population, a big middle class, a big working class. We will make them pay for our crisis. And that has happened over the last uh, two, three years in a very es escalated manner where uh, the cost of the crisis has been put onto the backs of ordinary people. How? By, in by having shock increases in oil prices, by having uh, increases in food prices, having an inflation of over 40% in Pakistan, including food inflation of over 30%. So the poorest people are paying the price for a crisis that they never created to repay loans that never reached them and to sustain an elite that has very little interest in, in increasing the productive forces within the country. And we are working in, working in a lot of working class areas, particularly in Lahore and Faisalabad. And we've seen people who, because of the current economic crisis, have taken their children out of schools to pay their electricity, electricity bills in August and September, which were unprecedentedly high. They were done, in, they were increased in order to repay uh, these independent power projects, repay some of the loans to private banks and international financial institutions. And the result was absolute uh, financial catastrophe for middle income uh, and, and working class families. And, uh, you know, we, so I said, we met people who could no, no longer afford to, uh, to, to buy medicine for their parents, put their children in school. Some of them sold their refrigerators, their mobile phones, their uh, motorbikes in order to pay their electricity bills. 
So this is the kind of sacrifice that is being expected of the elite, of, of uh, the Pakistani public, while you have the other side of Pakistan, the tiny 1% of Pakistan, which every summer is going abroad for vacations, where you have private schools now that, that, uh, uh, that cost about 60,000 rupees per month. You have uh, children in working class families whose parents cannot pay 500 rupees per month because it's too expensive. And then you have the elites that can pay, that are paying 60,000 because these elites are being subsidized by the state. Uh, I'll go on to the, to the second uh, argument and I'll try to end it there. Uh, along with this economic crisis, when you do not have enough to give, when the state can no longer win the consent of the people, when the state can no longer make the people identify with itself, the only option that's left for the state is brute force. And this is something we've seen progressively happen over the past many decades, and it's escalated over the last few years. Uh, even in the last parliament that just left, there were a number of uh, legislations that were done in order to suppress the people. This included uh, the in, uh, institution of military courts. Uh, it included uh, uh, Army Act, uh, whereby people could be tried for any kind of uh, an action that was that would be deemed seditious by those in power. And basically, the political class has handed over key decision making to the military. And part of the calculus is that everybody in the elite circles feels that this country can no longer be run without some kind of an authoritarian force that, that, that puts people in, in its place. So it's a very much a return to colonial times uh, whereby, uh, whereby the, the, the purpose of governance was not to win over people, was not to uh, ensure the welfare of the people, but to exercise brute force and to ensure that people fear the rulers rather than loving them. And this is the change that we've seen over the past few months as well. People increasingly fear uh, the establishment, they fear the military, they fear the, the, the intelligence apparatus, and down on the ground level as well, you see a lot of uh, 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 police stations acting with impunity. If they, anybody says this person is anti-state, that person's life becomes extremely difficult. There's liberal use of the sedition case. There are all these cases of journalists and political workers kidnapped and then brought in for interviews uh, to, to switch loyalties. Um, a lot of young activists, particularly from the peripheries, Baloch, Pashtun activists have been picked, have been killed uh, in recent years. And this again, this process has escalated over the, over the last few, few months. And finally, because there is, because the mainstream political parties are losing uh, legitimacy, they're losing support, there's a vacuum that's being opened up. And one of the fears that we have is that this vacuum can be used by extreme right-wing religious forces in Pakistan. And we saw a trailer of that in uh, Janabala near Faslava, where a, a mob of religious extremists attacked a Christian community, and uh, and we're seeing and then you know uh, destroyed their churches, and there was there was fear and terror in the area for for a very long time. We went there for a, a fact finding mission as well, and we found out that this attack was not something that happened spontaneously. It was a very well organized, well planned attack led by uh, a political party, a right wing religious party, and no policemen on the ground was willing to come between the uh, mobs and the churches because they were not sure uh, what the state policy is. We're seeing similar things in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, particularly in the Fata area and parts of Balochistan, where there's a revival of the Taliban, who, uh, very, I mean, just yesterday, I don't know if you saw on uh, social media, uh, these religious clerics forced a professor to openly sign a document saying I'll never teach Darwinism 
uh, in, in my classrooms. So what we're seeing is that with, the, with, with this collapse of ec the economic situation, collapse of political parties, this uh, de decay of the social fabric, we will see more and more fake issues being created to divert the populations. These will be phantoms. There will be more the, the chances of more violence against women's rights activists, against minorities, against ethnic groups. Uh, and the idea would be to, uh, to divert the attention of the public from the, the elites and their luxurious lifestyles and the ruthless manner in which they exploit the public and to distract them towards non-issues, towards phantoms, suggesting that your real enemy is the Hindu, your real enemy is a Christian, your real enemy is a, uh, is a, is a feminist, is, is, is a leftist. And in order to stem this potential fascism, it is very important that uh, political groups uh, uh, here in Pakistan uh, increase their work on the ground. We're doing. We're trying to do our best with uh, organizing factory workers, making sure that we fight for issues that reflect the bread and butter issues of the public, so that they do not move towards a reactionary form of politics. We organize women uh, at a, on, on a mass level. We have a comrade here, Rifat Maksud, who's worked on it, uh, on, on organizing women. And there are many others who've done it uh, uh, over the years. We need to strengthen these groups or, in order to like uh, resist the, the expected onslaught. And in this struggle, to develop an alternative that's based on issues of justice, economic justice, political justice, and social justice, an alternative that's based on uh, very much the principles that the overseas pro progressive Pakistanis espouse. Um, I think uh, we, we will have to work together because these right-wing forces, unfortunately, they're more internationalist than us. They have better global networks. They are more in tune with, with their members all over the world. And I think Hakuka uh, Khal Party and other progressive groups in Pakistan uh, we've been pushing this for a very long time. I'm very glad this dialogue is happening. We need more internationalism, more integration uh, to work together so that we can build a, a, a united front. And just remember, no matter how strong fascists are, they fight for issues that are non-issues. They will always be questioned by the public if there's a good enough alternative. Uh, it was the left that defeated Hitlerism and Nazism and the left can defeat fascism in our society as well, if we come up with a bold vision and if we show you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Amar. Uh, given, a, given a fact that uh, Dr. Amar has to leave, not right now, but a bit, a bit earlier than we close the meeting, so we have to change the format slightly before Farooq Tariq comes in. Uh, if any one of the participants would like to ask Amar any question, please do so. Uh, and after that question answer session with Dr. Amar Ali Jan, we will have uh, Farooq Tariq to speak. So please, uh, anyone who wants to go first to ask any question, uh, Manas. Uh, hello, Manas. We hope you are well. Yeah. Um, please. Uh, I yes. honestly feel that young intellectuals and leaders like Amar Adijan are a ray of hope for Pakistan, for old people like us. And Amar, as you said, that Pakistan is the welfare state for the rich. And similarly, democracy here is for the rich, by the rich. And so what's the solution for common people? I mean, how can we have a welfare state of common people and how can we have a democracy of common people, their establishment and rich, I mean, they don't rule our life. I and mean, what should we do? Thank you. Should, thank you so much. Should I answer or should we take all the questions? Yes, yeah, I think please, please go ahead in the meantime. Uh, thank you so much, Minas. Um, I'm really honored uh, for your kind words. Um, I do think one of the reasons why uh, the elites are able to manipulate uh, all policies in their favor 
is because ordinary people have been disorganized. They are not disorganized. They have been systematically in a planned way disorganized. Trade unions have been destroyed. Student unions have been destroyed. Uh, women's rights committees have been destroyed. Kisan committees have been destroyed. Any institution from where grassroots leadership could come up was systematically destroyed. And this, in a way, started even in the 70s. Uh, uh, and you know, you look at all political, three major political parties, they have a consensus on uh, suppressing these uh, institutions from emerging because this is where these could be grassroots alternatives. These could be nurseries for producing different kinds of leaders. We are, um, you know, I, I work in the area of Port Lakhpat, which was the hub of the working class movement in the 70s, 80s. And um, I love meeting uh, old people in the area and anywhere actually, but uh, in the area because they've seen movements that we have never seen in Pakistan. Um, they, they, they've seen uh, workers' demonstrations uh, in, in coach with student professors marching together for the vision of a better world, a different world. We need to bring that vision again. For that, we'll have to go deep into society. Uh, we're trying our best. Uh, some of you may know uh, we are contesting this time from Lahore from one seat. Uh, uh, it's called PP160 for the Punjab Assembly. And we are putting all our resources in this one constituency because if we can fight and if we can defeat PMLN, PTI on one seat, I think we will create a symbol of hope uh, in Punjab. Even if we don't defeat them and do well, I think it would still create this, this uh, alternative, uh, an alternative hope that a grassroots movement can emerge and can defeat the powerful. So we have to start uh, small, but with a big vision. And the big vision is to create uh, to, to rekindle the dream for which so many people fought, many even died for in the 70s, 80s. I think that dream is worth fighting for, worth defending, and uh, worth projecting in the current uh, moment of uh, despair. Okay, okay. thanks. Uh, thanks, Amar. I have two more persons who have raised hands. One is Khurshid Bhatti and Dr. Kar and I'm thinking, like, how can we instill these progressive values or the kind of the social ideas and the kind of the idea that Amar you're thinking and then well, how can we you know like uh, create a mass movement especially among the students 60 percent of our dem demographic population you know it consists of these young students you know and all of them when I talk to them you know like being a university professor all of them you know like they have got this sort of shallow mindset you know it's not very thinking in depth or being critical thinker you know so Do most like of to... them would you like to respond, Dr. Amar? Because it, it is slightly off topic, but if you can have a brief uh, re response to that. Because uh, Dr. Kaiser well, uh, is... Sure, Dr. Kaiser, it was uh, good, to, good to be introduced to you, and I'd be very happy to meet you in Lahore, of course. Uh, in terms of the, the youth, I think there's a very serious crisis. Uh, uh, young people, uh, of course, have been fed uh, a very doctored version of history. Um, the ideological training that's been done over the past 30, 40 years. It's a mix of uh, right-wing talking points and indifference towards society. So you must only think about yourself and moving forward. Um, I think there is, though, um, a kind of uh, a latent desire on the part of the youth to find some meaning because there is a collapse of meaning for a lot of young people. Uh, even in terms of career prospects, there's there, there are hardly any left now for, for a vast majority of people. Uh, but also in terms of ideological anchors, uh, people are dissatisfied uh, because, you know, things that they were taught, Pakistania, religiosity, all of those things, even those ideologies are in a state of crisis at the moment. So as, as a professor, and you're a professor, of course, my colleague, uh, it's part of our job is to reach out to students with a with an alternative vision of what life could be, what does it mean to, to be in the world? And what does it mean to be in the world in a moment of extreme injustice and extreme multiple forms of crisis? And I, I think it's a, it's a starting point for a conversation. And I still think that the youth, one good thing is that the youth will no longer go towards um, uh, traditional parties. Um, I mean, PTI is the last stop on that. And I, I don't think they'll go back to mainstream parties. And this is where new progressive voices can come in. And we've experienced that with the student march that we did in 2019, uh, which uh, captured the imagination of the nation back in the day. 
uh, I think we can we can re re remake that history, re repeat that history, and give people uh, a, a broader vision of what what Pakistan could be like and what life could be like here. Uh, but for that, we'll have to listen to the youth and engage with them. Okay, thank you. Thank, I think uh, you two will click very well because Dr. Kasser has been a long-time supporter of OPP, very active one. So I think it's... Uh, now, what, may I ask Mr. Hushi Bhatti to ask his question? And Pakistan again and again going in the crosses. Who will end this poverty? Who will end this crisis? We are not serious to end this crisis and end this poverty. I have a visit in Bangladesh. I have working in Africa. I work in international law talk and I saw the communities, the people, the country, the parties all working on one issue and tackle it and the poverty end. Look at the Bangladesh. They reach every people with the safe drinking water, with the sanitation, with the health and all. What we are doing? We are hundreds of NGOs, INGOs, NGOs. We have billions of funds, but we are wasting food, non-food item, food, non-food item. What we are doing? Why not we giving them the safe drinking water? Why not giving them kitchen gardening? Why not giving them the livestock? People will focus to the poor and indigenous people to help them to bring them uphill and support them with the skills and some of the activities like safe digging water are 80 percent rural people still uh, behind contaminated water and uh, and uh, washrooms so if we tackle the poor i assure you pakistan is up front pakistan is a good enough pakistan is a lot of people we are rich people and nothing else just yep. to meet the crisis and end the poverty yeah, absolutely. You're right. It's, uh, I think Dr. Amar would like to respond to that. Like, what can uh, we do? Why, why others can resolve their crisis and we cannot? Yes, I would actually uh, say uh, something, then I'd have to leave because I have to be somewhere in 10 minutes. Uh, uh, my apologies for that. Um, I, I think there is, uh, you know, as Bharti Sahib has stated, and, and many of us know some of these problems. Uh, my only uh, uh, Concern is that none of this will be resolved without building a strong alternative, because this eventually is not a question of economics. This is not a question of rationality, of reason. Everybody knows that's wrong to give this much subsidies to the sugar mafia. It's wrong to invest this much money on uh, the luxurious lifestyle of generals, of uh, feudals uh, in Pakistan. So it's not a question of whether people think it's right or wrong. Part of, the problem is that, part of the problem is that people do not feel that there's any force in society that can fight these entrenched forces. And the task for us, in my opinion, is to build those, those forces, forces that can actually fight them. And I, you know, there are a lot of brilliant people in Pakistan who are working on the ground. Farooq Saab is one of them. Temur Rahman is working. There are groups, other leftist groups. Uh, many of them you, you know about. Uh, uh, AWP is there. Others, there are people who are working, but I think there needs to be a more concerted uh, effort to uh, build uh, an alternative force. And my, uh, part of my, you know, there are two things that, I feel needs to be done in the in the next few years. One is to increase our pedagogy, which is to say we engage with the youth and other sections of society with progressive ideas. Uh, the mullahs are sending their messages every week from the mosque and the and the madrasas. We need to increase our educational efforts in order to give an alternative point of view. And second, we need to build our institutions. We need to strengthen our student groups. Our trade unions, or, uh, uh, other networks from which, through which people can recognize us. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, 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 of course, uh, uh, the women's rights movement is a very important thing as uh, Comrade Rifath is pointing out. Uh, so these movements that are challenging the reactionary forces, they need to come together, they need to be strengthened. And that is the task that we have in mind. The only way we'll be able to divert these 2,700 
rupee billion rupee subsidies 70.4 billion dollar subsidies from the elites to the people is when the people are organized today the pakistani government is willing to sell our entire sovereignty our economic policies our our state assets for 2 billion dollars from imf whereas elites are taking 17 billion in in subsidies every year this kind of madness must stop it's about time we say ordinary people their children should no longer be the sacrificial lambs this time if someone should sacrifice for pakistan it should be the generals it should be the bureaucrats it should be the feudal elites it should be the judges and not ordinary people and for that we will have to organize ourselves and we will have to fight back uh my sincere apologies i'll have to leave now well, thank you we obviously wanted to have more of you and i'm sure there will be a next time and uh, but thank you very much for for coming over and participating thanks uh i would like now uh, farooq tarikh to to take over and uh, share his thoughts with us okay thank you uh i think amar has spoken about in detail about the recent crisis and the reasons behind it i will just take up the present political scenario and some geographical political uh, developments which is taking place now with the return of nawaz sharif uh, there is a great euphoria among the media at present time that uh, he will do he will make pakistan better and we have seen in the past the policies of muslim league nawaz which are no different than the policy which imran khan has adopted or earlier people's party has adopted it's not personalities it's the policies that will make pakistan better uh, than what it is at present time so yesterday with the help of the establishment a, a very big show was uh, staged uh, in lahore and uh, nawaz sharif uh, was given a, a, a protocol which he would love to uh, and he he has been seems very happy there was a lot of emotional scenes but that is with the ruling class but there are many bad scenes among the working class at present time i think this is the worst economic crisis i have seen in my life um, almost every single every single item of consumption is expensive how expensive we can debate on that but you see that the the price hike is a non stop non ending phenomenon at present time there is no control of the state and uh, the rich are given extreme possibilities to make more profit for instance the sugar mafia they profited billions of rupees in during last month the sugar went from 100 to 150 and then 250 to 200 and now it has come back to some extent so why why sugar became expensive there was no dollars involved it is not imported it is made in pakistan it is made by the uh, sugar cane of the peasantry of pakistan so all the local labor and the industry is involved still they made billions of rupees profit by enhancing the price of the sugar and there was no control at all why because the the sugar mill owners belongs to tehreek e insaf to people's party to muslim league nawaz and some of the religious parties so they are all there uh, to make uh, the profit so is the case of electricity now at this time there is an unprecedented mass movement of uh, ordinary people in kashmir which are burning the electricity bill in bulk and they are saying that it is our water that you are using to make uh, electricity and uh, the cost is not more than 4 5 rupees um, a unit and you are costing us 53 rupees a unit at present time and so is the case of uh, uh, people uh, in uh, all parts of pakistan people are rebelling because of unprecedented price hike of electricity and this all to please the international financial institutions 
like IMF and World Bank. Now, IMF has have tightened the grip around Pakistan economy's neck, not just because they do it every time with every country. This is right because of the Chinese influence in Pakistan. So geopolitics comes here where uh, IMF made uh, everything possible that Pakistan should bow their neck in front of uh, IMF and they, sh they should uh, uh, get that money uh, and don't go to, towards... Uh, uh, they were teaching lesson to Pakistani ruling class why you're going towards the Chinese uh, uh, on BRI and on CPAC. So we see this uh, international politics intervening in the internal life of Pakistan. Now, Nawaz Sharif said earlier that if we would have not raised the prices, the dollar would have gone to 1,000 rupees, Pakistan would have been bankrupt. And uh, uh, so as the case was the Sri Lanka. So I think a bankruptcy of Pakistan is better because people are already uh, bankrupted and you see the conditions of people. It's the ruling class who want to save themselves by uh, by going on and look at Sri Lanka. When they defaulted, it was good default. They could reorganize the loans. They could say, we have no money. How could we pay? So the international institutions has to reorganize their debt repayments. Now, Pakistan is trying their best the ruling class trying their best to fulfill all the conditionalities just that they should not be defaulted. So they are giving an impression that if Pakistan is defaulted, it will be a massive uh, economic disaster. Yes, disaster for the ruling class, but not for ordinary people. Because international institutions has to come back to Pakistan so what are you going to do? How are you going to pay? So you have some breathing space and you can think what to do. And so I think our campaign against suspension of foreign debt in Pakistan is getting an air everywhere. And we say that uh, we have no money. Well, how could we pay the tax? How we could pay your foreign debt? 124 billion rupees, uh, billion dollars at this time, Pakistan owes to foreign uh, institutions. But they paid this year around $12 billion just to receive $1.9 billion uh, installment of IMF. And in this, we see that the Pakistan is becoming like a playground for the international politics where Modi has become darling of the American imperialism, European imperialism, and then uh, Chinese are tilting towards Pakistan and they are they have just had a BRI convention with heads of state where the attacker prime minister was also there and there they have promised some more support for this uh, rail link from Peshawar to Karachi. So I mean Pakistan has benefited in infrastructure development by the CPAC of 45 billion rupees has 45 billion dollar has been invested by Chinese in Pakistan much higher than what IMF and World Bank has done. So all the development of these motorways and others, which are not really bringing new life to Pakistan because industrialization is the only way uh, that Pakistan come out of the crisis. It's not just the infrastructure, it's the industrial infrastructure. It's the uh, lowering of price of electricity, it's lowering the price of, of gas, uh, lowering the price of uh, um, all the uh, other uh, uh, energy items uh, that will make uh, Pakistan competitive uh, in, in the international market. Uh, at this time, there's a severe crisis of textile industry. Most of the textile industry is closed. Our uh, labor movement in um, our uh, labor commie movement in Faisalabad to, tells us that over half of the textile industry in Faisalabad is closed down already because they say, we can't afford this price of electricity. And why this electricity prices? Because of the pressure of IMF and the implementation by closing their uh, eyes and implementing from ABC to, to all. So Pakistan main crisis, economic crisis at present time has emerged from the political crisis it has gone through. 
and there is a great suppression of tarikins of activist at present time it's only us who organize a seminar at uh, lahore high court organized a human rights conference in lahore and demanded that if there is a, a case against a pti activist go to the court and bring them to the court don't just disappear them and uh, don't violate the human rights and this is not acceptable what you're doing to crush the pti we don't share the strategies the politics the overall uh, methods of uh, pti uh, during the four years and not even now but we are here to defend the human rights the democratic rights of all pakistani and what is now the state that pakistan has become much more dictatorial and we see even sheikh rashid has to say that uh, i main to chilla kaat raha tha and you can see uh, several i mean prominent people have been missing now in pakistan it's not the only politician is the journalist who are missing so we have raised the voice against this uh, uh, dictatorial measures by the present uh, uh, setup because imran khan was darling at one time it is now out of their favor so this is the main problem of pakistani politics that it has been dominated by multi establishment and they guide the civilian affairs they guide what is happening at present time and here we are we are saying that it's not the army who should run uh, the pakistani civilian life it's the civilian who should run so nawaz sharif has come back he was famous for his anti establishment comments but now he has also uh, toba taib and he said that uh, i will focus on pakistan i forgive everyone and all that but we know very well what you say in opposition is different when you are not in power you can say anything we only trust you when you 